Are you ready for some new types of armor and new ways to stake your claim to the D&D world? Check out the companion set today on The Old Dragoon. Welcome back to The Old Dragoon. We made some adjustments to the volume and the credit intro thing so hopefully it won't be as loud as some of the commenters had let us know um so tonight we're going to be moving on in the beck me basic expert companion masters immortals version of DD the version i started with by looking at the companion now the companion set came in two books remember that the expert set was a single book split into two sections this comes back to the way the red box was presented with one book for players and one book for dungeon masters. So the player's book is up first and we're going to take a look at it. Once again, some awesome cover art featuring one very brave fighter fighting a dragon. Now by this time, we're covering levels 15 and above. So that fighter may actually have a chance and it looks like that two-handed sword of his is almost certainly magical. So let's start taking a look at the PDF. So, once again, it's a saddle stapled book with a cardboard cover. The player's book is a 32 page affair with the DM's book being twice that long. We get a preface from Brian Bloom this time. Um, Brian Bloom was one of the um, the original members of TSR Hobbies, remembering that Tactical Studies Rules was an affair between Gary Gygax and Don Kay, who tragically died of a heart attack. The Blooms, uh, Brian and eventually his father Melvin and his brother Kevin, um, came in with either money or uh, positions within the company, or both, and helped out. And that's where TSR went from Tactical Studies Rules to TSR Hobbies. So Brian Bloom writes the intro to this uh, this particular book. We get a table of contents. Um, we are sticking to Larry Elmore and Jeff Easley as the illustrators so that the entire line has a cohesive look to it. And let's take a look at what we've got in store for players. I have got to admit it was a lot of fun reading this set again fresh. Because a lot of times when I run Beck Me Dungeons and Dragons, I do so out of the Rules Cyclopedia, which is a hardcover book that followed all these box sets and summed up everything through the master set. Immortals was actually a revised box set called Wrath of the Immortals that came out at that time. But everything in these first four box sets was compiled into the Rules Cyclopedia. And so it's easy for me to forget what specific rules appeared in what specific box sets. So let's take a look at what we were introduced to in this teal covered box set. So we get some information from author and editor Frank Menser on exactly what these higher level games are going to look like. And for the first time, we get an inkling of the paths to immortality. So your character's becoming more powerful. You've reached name level. You know, you've reached the level where your character can actually settle down and rule something. But what's beyond that? Well, obviously, immortality. If you remember, the basic Dungeons & Dragons rules shied away from the concept of gods and instead went with immortals, which stood in the same design space but were explicitly formerly mortal characters who had ascended to immortality. So here you're presented with the paths to becoming immortal and an overview of what higher level games are going to look like. And then the question, are you going to settle or are you going to continue to travel? And that is not just a simple question of how do you intend to play the game, there are a couple of options that depend on that choice. We'll get to that in a moment. So, we have new weapons and armor. Remember that uh, as we walked into basic, we got leather and chain and plate. And that was our options. So here, 
we add scale mail between leather and chain, and we add banded mail between chain and plate. So now, give or take a shield, every armor class number from 7 down to 2 is now available. Or I should say 9 down to 2. Remember, an unarmored character in this version of D&D is armor class 9, not 10, as you would find in AD&D and in the revisions where armor class starts at 10 and goes upward instead of downward, like everything after 3rd edition. So, we have these new armor types. We have some new weapons, like the Bastard Sword, which can be used one or two-handed. Um, the Heavy Crossbow, which can only fire every two rounds. The Net, the Trident, the Whip. Now, the interesting thing with all these is, as you can see at the bottom of this page, there are now special effects available for weapons. You're not simply walking in, rolling your d20, and then rolling a damage die. You've actually got some other things that can happen, like entangling, slowing, um, stunning, knocking out with the, the blackjack. That is a great weapon for thieves to use coming up behind somebody. Uh, blowguns can even be treated with poison to cause paralysis or death. So you've got these new options that are added in. And this is one of the things I was talking about a moment ago. In the rule cyclopedia, these were available from level one. And there's no reason they shouldn't be available from level one if you're starting a new Beck Me campaign. But as we bought the box sets in order, we didn't know these existed until we got here. So here's the new armor and weapons. There's some cool artwork. Oh, and explanation of the different armor and weapons. And then we move into a system for unarmed combat. Now, I really remember that we used to just roll as if we were rolling to hit a various armor class. And then our DM let us do a point of damage, give or take, strength bonus. Meaning that the weaker characters couldn't do any damage at all, really, with the punch. This gives you an official system for how to strike so that you can uh, execute non-lethal combat in D&D with some official rules. Now, that did not exist until this point, but now we've got a system for it with results like knockouts, and it can be a lot of fun. But it does add an extra level of complexity to the game since it is a different subsystem than standard combat. There's also a wrestling system that's covered on the next two pages that allows you to come up with a wrestling value. You roll a d20 and add to it and you compare the wrestling values of the wrestlers involved to figure out exactly what's going to happen. Um, you can pin someone and restrain them, which might be very, very useful if you're trying to capture a bad guy or take someone alive so that uh, you can interrogate them later. And then we get into the part that I remember thinking was the coolest part of the book, or one of the two coolest parts, strongholds. We have been exposed to the rules for building strongholds in the expert set, but this takes them to another level. It zooms in and gives you a lot more detail on exactly how to put your stronghold together, how the stronghold is going to work from month to month, who lives there, who does what jobs. And from there, we will uh, expand into the domain rules. Another piece of awesome artwork. And then we get into the classes. So the clerics up first as usual because they're in alphabetical order. And you can see there are a lot more Ds on this turning undead chart, including D pluses um, and, and the D with the pound sign. So you are destroying more and more and more undead. A 25th level cleric destroys 4D6 skeletons. Or 46 hit dice worth of skeletons, but most skeletons are one hit die anyway, so there you go. Um, 
we're now looking at leveling in the range of millions of experience points. 17th level is a cool million experience points with 100,000 needed to advance past that. That's some big numbers. And at 17th level, you finally gain access to what is the ultimate level of clerical magic in this version of D&D, which is 7th level clerical magic. We'll take a look at some of the spells that will become available, but it's ridiculously powerful. Now, magic user spells will go to 9th, but clerics only get to 7th, but wow, some of that 7th level magic is very, very impressive. So... You see that there is notations at the bottom of this page about the choice bet between, between becoming a landowner and choosing to travel. This is a very early version of what 3rd edition D&D would call prestige classes, which has kind of survived into the current 5th edition, but you tend to pick one up much, much earlier. Third level for most classes, second level for mages, but I understand they're going to smooth it all out to third in whatever one D&D &D ends up being. But that's when you pick sort of a subclass, sort of a specialty. In this version of D&D, &D, you had to wait until you were in the upper levels to make this determination. But a traveling cleric will have a different set of abilities than a cleric that decides to establish a clerical stronghold. And that's what's, that's what's discussed here. So let's take a look at that list of spells. We have commune, we have create food, cure critical wounds. Um, insect plague was always fun. Raise dead. Now it's not just for NPCs anymore. This is something the party cleric can do. The party cleric can actually raise an ally. Um, and then uh, true sight, we get to sixth level, aerial servant, animate objects, barrier, you can throw up a magical wall, um, cure all, speak with monsters, word of recall. That is a very useful spell to sort of what we what we now call GTFO from a situation. And then the seventh level clerical spells, Earthquake, Holy Word, Raise Dead Fully. How is that different from Raise Dead? Well, Raise Dead, as it was presented in the expert set, shows you that yes, you can raise someone who's been killed, but they're going to have a period of weakness where all they can do is rest until they start to regain their strength. Raise dead fully will skip a lot of that period and allow the person raised to get right back into the action. Restore is a useful spell used for giving back those energy levels that were drained one of the things that scared my players more than anything else in this version of D&D &D was fighting level draining undead. All that work, all the monsters slain, the treasure recovered, the adventures had to work your way up to these higher levels, especially the elf players who are basically having to level twice for every other character in the game, they feared losing those levels. Level draining undead were scary. Um, because they took away all that hard work and they reduced your character's ability in the middle of a fight, which meant you were even less likely to destroy those undead. Restore helps give back some of that which was lost. So, now we have the option to become a druid. This has been cause for some debate. Um, one of my friends in my gaming group here in Austin is Dr. Dennis Sister, who created the Druid class back in the 70s when it was published in Eldritch Wizardry. So he's he's been credited as the Great Druid. The original class that Dennis submitted started out at first level. As of this revision, Frank Mincer made this a class that you must first reach ninth level as a cleric, and then you could choose to become a druid. This was a little odd for some of us because druids 
have to shed some of the abilities clerics have. They can no longer wear metal armor. They no longer have the ability to turn undead. They do gain access to um, druid spells, of which there are there are several. As you can see here, there's three listed for each level, including first level. So one might ask, why can't someone be a druid from first level? In my games, I allow that to happen. But at North Texas RPG Con, I had the uh, opportunity to play D&D with and talk to Frank Mentzer, and I asked him that very question. Uh, Mr. Menser said that he very specifically made Druid a class that someone had to be ninth level as a cleric first to branch into Druid because he felt like Druid was a more complex class to play and required the player to have a greater mastery of the game to understand how to properly play a Druid and use the Druid's strengths and minimize the Druid's weaknesses. Therefore, he wanted the player to have made it to ninth level as a cleric before they tried their hand at Druid. So that's how he wrote this entry. So in a way, you could say this, this kind of was the first prestige class because rather than just being a variation um, on like the difference between the Avenger fighter and, well, we'll see fighter in a moment, but Druid does seem to be a little more of a departure from straight up cleric. So this might be sort of the first prestige class kind of arrangement. So Druids have spells, again, starting from first level. So they have access to the clerical spell list plus this Druidic spell list. Uh, like Fairy Fire, Predict Weather, Locate, uh, Produce Fire, Warp Wood... One of my favorites was the third level spell Call Lightning because Call Lightning actually had a duration and you could call more than one lightning bolt. But it was a rather long duration between lightning bolts. So it was really much, much more useful as a spell in the middle of a pitched battle than it was in a dungeon. In fact, it sort of required access to the sky above you, as I recall. Um, so... It wouldn't be all that useful in a dungeon. Outdoors, however, in the druid's domain, it could be deadly. So there's some other spells that are fun to play around with. Creeping Doom, Metal to Wood, things like that. Um, you can take a look for yourself if you grab yourself a copy of this off drive through RPG or DM's Guild. Or if you're lucky enough to get a physical copy. They're becoming more and more dear these days. So we get to fighter. What does the fighter get? Well, if you choose to be a landowning fighter, you can become a knight if you're lawful. Or as you were, I'm sorry. If you become a landowning fighter, you can build your keep, your castle, and start ruling an area. A traveling fighter becomes a different type of fighter based on their alignment. So a lawful fighter... Uh, can become a paladin or a knight. A neutral fighter can become a knight. And a chaotic fighter can become something called an avenger, which is a little bit like what we used to call an anti-paladin. But this is where those classes are introduced into the basic D&D game. You'll notice that um, the fighter requires... A few more XP than the Cleric still at this level. And more XP per level to move up. The saving throws are great for the, for the fighter by this level. But you put so many experience points in just to get where the Halfling is at like 8th level. But uh, fighters get a number of abilities depending on which of these options they choose. So fighters actually become pretty interesting at the higher levels. I remember players getting a little bored with the fighter towards the end of the levels in the master, or as you were, the expert set. So the the 9th to 14th, you, you did get those cool fighter maneuvers at 9th level, and that was about it. 
you got some good hit points. You can use whatever weapons you find. And by then, you've probably picked up a magic sword or two. But as far as distinctive abilities that give you sort of that feeling like the, the cleric has, or even the thief, things you can do that no one else can, that really starts to take effect with the rules in this set. So magic users, this is where you start getting into the magic that really, really affects the, the game world. Or um, a phrase that I picked up from a game rule book many years ago, really wangs the chang. The magic user starts out weak as a kitten. You know, the old joke is we'd toss a sleep spell or a magic missile spell and then hide behind the fighter for the rest of the day. But by the time you've got some levels under your belt and you start building up these massive numbers of spell slots, just take a look at the 15th level wizard on this chart. You've got five first level spells a day, plus four second level spells, plus four third level spells, plus four fourth level spells, three fifth, two sixth, and one seventh. That is a lot of spell casting ability in a single day. If you are still delving dungeons, at this level, you have got a ridiculous amount of magic to toss around. And remember that if you are one of those players that focuses on the magic missile, by the time you're high level, you're throwing multiple missiles that always hit every time you cast. If the rest of the party can keep the dragon off the magic user... <laughs> The magic user can generally drop the dragon with repeated application of never miss, can't be saved against magic missiles. So, um, you do once again have the choice between becoming a mage who builds a tower and stays in one place and being a traveling mage, which is referred to as a mage, magus. Um, you get different uh, abilities, different. you're regarded different socially, depending on what it is you are, you are doing. And either way you go, you are an extremely powerful character. You can pick up 8th and eventually ninth level spells. Once again, two more spell tiers than the cleric is capable of taking. And by ninth level, you are tossing some world-changing spells ridiculously powerful spells so let's take a look so those ninth level spells um, meteor swarm meteor swarm is like multi-fire fireball power word kill the ability to slay a creature up to a certain up to a certain point by simply speaking a word of magic I mean, wow. Um, in the 8th level, you've got Polymorph, Any Object, Power World Blind, um, Mass Charm, which is ridiculously useful. The charm spells in this version of D&D, &D, I believe we mentioned this in the Red Box discussion, did not tip off the, the victim that they were being charmed. And also, depending on the victim's intelligence, the saving throw could be days, weeks, or even months between attempts to break the spell. So, Mass Charm? That, that could be an instant army right there. Um, going backwards, there's some other very interesting spells that are fun to play with, like Reverse Gravity. That's always fun. Uh, teleport any object. There's a... Uh, I'm trying to remember where the spell... I read it earlier today when I was preparing. And trust me, I do try to prepare for these. But uh, ever since going under for, for surgery a couple of years ago, my brain does not recall things quite as clearly as it used to. But uh, there is a, a fun spell, and now that I'm thinking about it, it may have been in the blue box. But Mass Morph, it allows you to change everyone uh, in your party 
into what looks like a stand of trees so that the pursuers will just run right by, not, not recognizing what it is they've seen. So lots of new spell options for the magic user. The magic users become extremely powerful. So thieves, by this level, the thieves actually have a decent ability to do the things they're supposed to do. 75% open locks at 15th level. Finally, three out of four chance to open that lock. Climb walls has exceeded 100% because there are sometimes penalties that'll bring your roll down below that. So the thief can become a settled thief and start a thieves guild. Or they can become a traveling thief known as a rogue. Note that that's kind of what we call the class now because I guess it's less specific than thief. But again, there are guidelines written in this version for how to handle either situation. So it matters, the choice that you make. Now, this is where we get to kind of a conundrum. Remember that dwarves topped out at 12th level, elves topped out at 10th, and halflings topped out at 8th? What are they doing this entire time while the humans are continuing to advance? So the original expert set, the, the Zeb Cook, Steve Marsh expert set, that topped out at 14th level. And while it did say a companion set would follow, and as I understand it, Steve Marsh is working on that companion set now. He's getting ready to release what he believes the companion set would have looked like. And I'm very excited to see that. The game effectively ended at 14th level. So those demi-human level limits weren't quite so crippling because demi-humans were front-loaded with many abilities. Well, now we're talking about taking characters to 25th level. So what exactly is it the demi-humans do? Well, now this book introduces some rules that are also cultural cues to the demi-humans. How their clans work. What the relics that each clan guards and uses can do. And you're introduced to a new mechanic called an attack rank. But we'll talk to that about that in a bit. So these pages describe the relics for each of the demi-human species and what relics a given clan is likely to possess and what abilities those relics have. Remember that at this point, there was no such thing as a cleric in any of the demi-human species. The dwarf cleric was introduced in the Dwarves of Rockholm Gazetteer, but that's not here yet. So you get cure abilities associated with the clan's relic. So the relic sort of replaces the village priest or, or the curate or abbot or whatever higher level cleric would be necessary for a larger enclave of the demi-humans. So here you see an experience point chart for the dwarf. But instead of normal abilities being listed, you've got an attack rank, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. What they've basically done is assigned these letters to the hit charts for fighters. So all three of the demi-human species basically hit on the fighter chart. They had a fighter's attack progression as they leveled up. Once you reach maximum level, you no longer actually gain levels, but you do gain attack ranks, which makes you a better, better fighter as you accumulate experience points. You also gain some additional abilities. If you look at these pages, they'll explain certain saving throws automatically half damage on a fail, but then quarter damage on a success or, or no damage at all in some cases. You'll see different abilities associated with the different demi-humans. So they can, in fact, continue to adventure with their human allies and gain what are more or less levels. They're simply not gaining any more hit points. 
Here's the information on the halfling and what the halfling relic does. And some map symbols. And that brings us to the end of the player's companion. So what's in the DM's companion? Well, what's in the DM's companion is that other favorite piece of mine. Here's the Dungeon Master's companion. This book is, again, twice as long as the player's companion. Has a lot more information in there on exactly how these higher level games are to be run. I'm not sure why the PDF looks like that, but I don't think my original copy had boxes around the table of contents. So, advice for the DM on exactly how to run these higher level games. There's even some advice on how to set up how often your characters will level. We talk about the world, and here is my other favorite part. Dominions. Running your own little barony, or kingdom, or fiefdom. This gives you a complete set of rules. How many people move in? How much taxes do they pay? Um, how much resources do you have in the area that you've just conquered? And it's all organized around the basic 24-mile map hacks. So you can hex crawl your way out into your DM's map or, or into the Mistara map if you're using it and plant your flag in one of those hexes and start your dominion from there. Probably won't make the other local rulers too terribly happy unless you court their support first. But there's a full set of rules here that allow you to basically keep notes, roll dice, and play what's going on with your domain i always found this fascinating i found it really awesome to be able to play a character who is running their own little micro nation and that's not for everybody um my, i think a lot of modern players might find that a little fiddly i've noticed more and more game designs are getting away from beans and bullets they're getting away from counting the last copper piece and how many arrows are in your quiver and so this sort of detail would probably drive players crazy if they are into a more, you know, kinder, gentler record keeping system. Like one of the mechanics I, I actually like is written into several games that I've seen so far. You have a resource die and every time you use a resource, you roll that die. And if you roll high, your resource die does not change. However, if you roll low, your resource die reduces, say from a D8 to a D6, then from a D6 to a D4. And when you roll too low on the D4, or in a couple of cases a D2, um, you've run out of resource. So you're not actually keeping track of every single arrow the way we used to. In fact, uh, there are some AD&D character sheets that were officially published by TSR that had check boxes for you to check off every time you fired an arrow. So this system of actually running your dominion, this got middling complicated. And I say that as someone who grew up playing Traveler. Maybe my idea of middling complicated is not your idea of middling complicated, but you would occasionally have to do some upkeep, like every game month, figuring out what your income was and whether or not something unfortunate happened and if someone declared war on you. But it was here, and it was very cool. You could even run tournaments. Um, you do gain XP for participation in things like that, which is very, very cool. Your Dominion, like has a confidence level and here is how that affects your dominion your people can actually revolt if they don't like you too much here's the percentage chance of some natural events happening different titles that you can use and then here's the war machine this is the mass combat rules. Well, now that you can run a dominion, obviously you're going to need to be able to run an army. And, you know, 10 years before this book came out, they probably would have laid out a bunch of metal miniatures on the table and you would have gamed out a skirmish and chainmail to determine the winner. 
This gives you a theater of the mind version where you can add up all the numbers, run through with some die rolls, and figure out who won the battle. You could run entire wars this way. Your characters could have graduated from crawling through dungeons to now being in charge of, you know, Duke Stefan's legions, or, or your own legions for that matter. So the War Machine rules appear here and tell you how to figure out who won or who lost a particular battle. Ah, the combat results table. Those of us that grew up on Avalon Hill and SPI war games will recognize a CRT when we see one. Note that there is an entry, middle column towards the bottom, for PC heroics. This allows your player character to engage in individual missions of Daring Do to affect the overall battle, which is pretty darn cool. So there's some information here about the multiverse and the planes and how to travel between them because the characters are now in, you know, the upper tier levels between 15th and 25th. They're going to be able to do some pretty amazing things. We have to talk about aging now because characters are probably getting older. And there's more information on hit points, combat. Here's where you can see how the attack ranks stack up. And we get a new set of treasures and some new monsters, like the Beholder. Ah, the dragon turtle. I still get nightmares thinking about those. But the creatures are much, much more fearsome, as you might expect. And the treasures tend to be on a different level of power entirely. So by this point, you are really talking about getting into a different kind of D&D. &D. And the beginning of this book does sort of explain how to adjudicate that and how to make it feel. But by this point, you are usually not delving dungeons anymore unless it is an extremely uh, powerful dungeon. Like if it was you know, the crypt of an ancient wizard king or something that low-level characters would just not be able to deal with. There are some adventure ideas in the back of the book, and one of the ones that I'd like to draw your attention to is here, The Fall of the Black Eagle. That is because this is explicitly set in the known world, later known as Mistara, and this has you going up against Baron Ludwig von Hendricks, the guy that employed Bargle the Infamous, who killed off uh, Alina in the basic set. So there is an explicit setting in these ver this version of D&D. It's a great setting. It's one I have a lot of love for. And I very much wish they would bring it back. I think Mistara would make a great setting for modern players to be able to experience. This adventure does include write-ups for troops and you are expected to fight some mass battles. That's just cool. And so here we are at the end of the companion set with some obligatory advertisements. And, okay, this isn't really part of the game, but these take me back, seriously. The Marvel Super Heroes RPG is still in my head the most easy-to-teach supers RPG out there. I've played a lot of superhero games, and I've played a lot of really good superhero games. Um, but... For my money, 
the easiest one to teach a new player is classic TSR face rip marble. And we're going to cover that in a future episode. Um, amazing stories. People of a certain age will remember this book. They will also remember the Steven Spielberg series based on it. It's a anthology of amazing stories. Uh, Dragon Magazine. I really miss this era of Dragon. Thank heavens for that set of CD-ROMs that came out a couple decades ago with the first 250 issues of Dragon on it. They simply don't make anything like that anymore. I mean, we had Gygax Magazine for the wink of an eye, and I think it's a damn shame that we weren't allowed to have Gygax Magazine for the long term. But uh, Dragon is dearly missed. And then Star Frontiers. We're going to cover this one in a future episode, too. I have a deep and abiding love for Star Frontiers. It's a flawed game, but it's a fun game. And that is the end of the Companion Dungeon Master's book. So, two episodes from now, we're going to hit the Master's books and see what exactly they add. They will take us from 26th level to the, the ultimate level of 36th, where basic D&D stops. And after that, we're going to talk about immortality. So, what was your favorite part of this set? Did you allow druids from first level? Did you um, allow all of the extra armors to be available at low levels? Um, tell me what you thought. Tell me what you think. Tell me if the sound levels on the intro and outro are a little bit better this time around. I certainly don't want to be blowing anybody's speakers by accident. I'm still new at this, but I am very much enjoying it. I'm enjoying all your comments. So I think that brings us to the end of this episode. I'm glad I'm able to share my hobby and the history with you. And once we're through the Beck Me series of Dungeons and Dragons, because someone asked this in the comments, we will be looking at every edition of D&D, um, including the ones that came before this. I simply picked Beck Me to start out with because that's where I personally started. We will probably go backwards to 74 D&D. Um, I used to call it White Box, but I got corrected at a convention by Tim Kask, who pointed out that it's a wood grain box. The White Box came later. So we'll go all the way back to wood grain box and we'll move forward from there until we hit the point where Beck me was uh, in the history and we'll branch off and we'll also cover advanced Dungeons and Dragons. And then we will continue forward and take a look at the additions that followed. Now, I'm not going to be doing D&D &D every single episode. I like to mix it up. And so every other episode will be a different game. Now, I have noticed that taking a look at the episodes I've produced so far, the Dungeons and Dragons episodes have four times the views of all the other games. But I still feel committed to covering the other games that I've either played or intend to play. Hence us going back through some of the other TSR catalog games like Star Frontiers. Let me know also in the comments what you'd like to see. Um, is D&D really the main thing that we all want to talk about? Or is there some interest in some other games? Let me know. Until then, this has been the Old Dragoon. Remember that character is what you are in the dark. Take care.